Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the last, the very last lecture for the entire year. Woo! And then the villagers rejoice. Okay, so let's kick back into ecology. This is ecology part two. And we'll talk about succession. Natural changes in a community take place over time, and that's called community succession. Primary succession is when new land is formed, like a volcano erupts from the sea and it cools, that's new land. Um, and then it's colonized by life. So that's primary succession. Secondary succession is what you see here. It's a community, if a community is destroyed, it's then recolonized by living organisms. The final process in community succession is the climax community, which are stable, natural communities with little change. Climax communities in Idaho are most, are most commonly either mixed sagebrush grassland or ponderosa pine forest, depending on where you are in the state. Each ecosystem is made up of two types of factors. All life supporting layers of the earth are known as the biosphere and biotic factors are all living organisms in the biosphere. The abiotic factors are all the non-living things in the environment. So examples could be like air currents, temperature, elevation, moisture, light availability, soil composition, etc. So the biosphere is the entire life supporting unit of the earth. Anywhere life exists is the biosphere. Each biosphere is broken down in the biosphere is broken down into the major ecosystems and inside each ecosystem is communities then populations make up those communities, and then individual organisms make up those populations. So it's similar to a taxonomy where it's like the, Jack that, uh, the house that Jack built, where you go from broadest to most specific. There's different kinds of feeding types um, in ecosystems. Autotrophs are, are also called producers because they make their own food. So those would be the plants, the algae, the cyanobacteria, etc. Heterotrophs come in a couple of different flavors. Carnivores, which eat only meat. Omnivores, which eat both meat and plants. Herbivores, which eat only plants. And decomposers or detritivores, which eat dead stuff. When you look at the feeding types, though, they fit into these trophic relationships. So the producers are always at the bottom, and there's always the most of those. Um, and that's considered the first trophic level because they're producing their own food. However, producers are eaten by herbivores, which is the secondary trophic level. All herbivores are primary consumers. The end. That's, that's it. However, once you get to secondary consumer and above, you can have either carnivores or omnivores. So, for example, um, a bear, a black bear is a... Uh, second, it's a tertiary or even sometimes considered a, a, a quaternary consumer. It is an omnivore. It's the top of its food chain. And uh, what it does is it eats both plant and animal matter. So it's eating at all different levels of the trophic pyramid. So don't get confused that fourth level, you know, fourth trophic levels have to eat the ones below them. They don't. They can eat any of the levels below them as long as they're omnivores and they can eat any of the levels below them down to the second trophic level if they're carnivores. So here's a typical food web. And food webs are different from food chains because one, they show the dominance of the organism in its trophic relationship by its height in the picture. You can also see the Roman numerals that show that they're top level predators. And uh, food webs also combine multiple food chains so you can see the interaction in each ecosystem. And this is, again, still a simplified system, but it's way more complex than a food chain. Only 10% of the energy is transferred from one trophic level to the next. The rest is typically lost as heat. So for example, it takes 100 kilograms of plant material or producers to support 10 kilograms of herbivores. And it takes 10 kilograms of herbivores to support just one kilogram of secondary consumers, which is the first level of carnivore. So you can see that, that you get very little energy transfer between trophic levels. And so um, when you talk about this in a sustainability uh, aspect for few humans, the more vegetables you eat, the more you, you eat the producers instead, 
the more energy stays in the ecosystem and so it's more sustainable. Okay, to remind you about symbiosis, remember these are the three main types, commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. I just gave you a, a little uh, graphic to help you remember which one benefits and which one doesn't uh, based on last time's lecture. So I wanted to make sure that you saw that and I threw it in there because it, it seemed to be a little bit confusing. Okay, so let's look at how we impact the environment. Well, one way is acid rain. The primary comp compounds involved in acid rain are sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and carbon dioxide. And this is mostly caused by our combustion of fossil fuels. Acid rain has a very low pH, so it's pH of 4.0 or lower. And the effects are very wide ranging. They not only destroy buildings and statues and beautiful things of art, but they also destroy forests. And these are our producers. These produce oxygen, these produce food, energy for the things that we eat. And so by producing acid rain, we are basically undercutting the trophic pyramid. Let's look at the ozone layer. So ozone, which is three oxygens bonded together, blocks ultraviolet radiation. The ozone hole was first seen over Antarctica in 1985. There's now, a, there's a new identified one found over the Arctic. So this hole here is showing the, the lack of ozone over the Antarctica, but now there's a lack of ozone also over the Arctic. Ozone is destroyed by CFCs, which are chlorofluorocarbons, and they're found in coolant systems and propellants. And CFCs were stopped being produced in the United States in 1996. However, we're still seeing the effects of ozone destruction. So ozone loss results in higher rates of skin cancer, cataract, retinal cancers, and the loss of many species. A recent study of more than 6,000 species of amphibians worldwide concluded that 32% were threatened and 43% were declining in population. Chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, are a family of compounds that are developed back in the 1930s as a safe non-toxic, non-flammable alternative to dangerous substances like ammonia for purposes of refrigeration and spray can propellants. Their usage grew enormously over the years. One of the elements that make up CFCs is chlorine. Very little chlorine exists naturally in the atmosphere, but it turns out the CFCs are an excellent way of introducing chlorine into the ozone layer. The ultraviolet radiation at this altitude breaks down the CFCs freeing the chlorine, and under proper conditions, this chlorine has the potential to destroy large amounts of ozone. So a very small amount can create a huge massive effect because it's like a chain reaction. Halon is a, it was used as a fire extinguishing agent, and that's what this picture is showing you is a halon system for fire retardation. Um, it was used in both built-in systems and in handheld portable fire extinguishers. Halon production in the U.S. ended on December 31st, 1993, because they contribute to ozone depletion. They cause ozone depletion because they came, contain bromine, and bromine is many more times effective at destroying ozone than chlorine was. So CFC stopped being produced in 1996, Halon in 1994, essentially, and then we moved to carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tetrachloride was widely used as a raw material in many industrial uses, including the production of fluorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, and as solvent. Solvent use um, using carbon tetrachloride was ended when it was discovered that this is a carcinogen. In other words, it causes cancer. So we stopped um, producing carbon tetrachloride or using it in those industrial applications in 1996. Hydrochlorofluorocarbons, or HCFCs, <clears throat> are enable the, enabling the phase out of CFCs. HCFCs are one class of chemicals being used to replace the CFCs, and they do contain chlorine and thus deplete stratospheric ozone, but to a much lesser degree than CFCs or halon or carbon tetrachloride. And we're hoping to phase this out around about 2030. Finally, methyl bromide is an effective pesticide that use, is used to fumigate soil and many agricultural products. 
because it contains bromine, it also deplete, depletes the stratospheric ozone, and production was phased out in this country in 2005. Global warming is the increase in the average temperature of the Earth's near-surface air and oceans since the mid-20th century and its projected continuation. Global surface temperature increased 0.74 plus or minus 0.18 uh, degrees Celsius or between 1, 1 and 2 degrees Fahrenheit during the last century. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it really is. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, concludes that anthropogenic, in other words, man-made um, greenhouse gases are responsible for the majority of the observed temperature increase since the middle of the 20th century. And that natural phenomena such as solar variation and volcanoes probably had extremely small warming effects on uh, the atmosphere. Because Pre, uh, during the pre-industrial times to 1950 and a small cooling effect afterwards. So these basic conclusions have been endorsed by more than 40 scientific societies and academies of science, including all, okay, remind, I'm going to remember this, all of the national academies of science of major industrialized countries. In other words, every industrialized country on the planet their scientific researchers all agree that man-made greenhouse gases has created a global warming effect. Okay, so I'm saying that because there's a lot of naysayers to global warming and people go, oh, it's snowing in April, so it can't possibly be global warming. Well, that's not true. Average temperature increase creates instability in the atmosphere and that instability leads to more extreme weather swings. So don't get those two confused. We're not supposed to be parboiling here. We're supposed to, we're seeing more increase in weather. We're also seeing hotter summers and a bigger swing in the winters. Climate model projections summarized in the latest IPCC report indicate the global surface temperature will probably rise a further 1.1 to 6.4 degrees Celsius. That's a lot. That's two to 11 and a half degrees Fahrenheit during the 21st century. Greenhouse gases include carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous, nitrous oxide. Finally, let's take a look at pollution. Pollution comes in a lot of different forms, chemical, thermal, air, and sound. Um, there's a couple of other ones like light pollution, et cetera. Let's talk about the biggies. Chemical pollution is the introduction of chemicals into the environment that are harmful. And some chemicals that are introduced in the um, environment can be introduced in extraordinarily small amounts, small parts per billion or per trillion, and still cause a huge effect. Um, this picture here is, of course, a lot more severe chemical pollution, a lot more easily seen chemical pollution, and that's from an oil spill. Thermal pollution happens usually at the outflows of places like um, nuclear power plants and things like that. They eject hot water from the power plants um, and bring in fresh cool water. Well, that thermal pollution creates algae blooms. It creates a whole lot of different changes to the ecosystem. So that's a big problem. But Another big problem with thermal pollution is heat islands, which are created in every major city on the planet. Anytime you have a major city, you have very little green space. And as a result, the tarmac, the tops of buildings, etc., those things get, um, those things reflect heat. And by reflecting heat, they create their own weather systems and create even more severe weather in those areas where those heat islands are. Air pollution, pretty simple. Air pollution is, you know, particulates in the air that can cause problems. Same with water pollution. And then there's sound pollution. And sound pollution is a big issue here in Idaho because there's a big, um, there's a lot of competition between conservation groups and outdoor recreation groups because many people like in Yellowstone, for example, they want to ride their snowmobiles in the park when the, the snow's in there. And um, many of the conservationists are saying, no, you can't, or you can't all the time. 
because the sound disturbs the breeding habits, the migration patterns and stuff of all the wildlife in that area. And so that's kind of a little more hard to prove one. Um, it's just, just a thing. And for light pollution, if you live in a city, you'll notice that there's far fewer stars that you can see than there are in the country. And for that reason, light pollution is a serious issue, not just for people who look at stars like astronomers and astrophysicists and such, but it's also a problem because it interferes with movements of animals. It, it interferes with their migration patterns. It interferes with their ability to catch prey. And so that's actually a fairly serious thing. So let's look at some of the basic things that we can do. Well, the first one is to vote. And vote responsibly. That means you actually research the issues before you vote. Don't just go, hey, I like that guy or, or that guy was... was uh, support, you know, that candidate was supported by this radio station I really like, so I'm going to go vote for him or her. Don't do that. Actually look at the issues that are important to you. If environmental issues are important to you, then you look down the environmental voting records of those candidates, or you look at their platform of those candidates on the issues that are important to you. So vote. Buy from responsible companies. And by responsible companies, I mean the ones that are actually aware of their carbon footprint, for example. The ones that are trying to actually improve or they replant forests or they use renewable energy sources in order to uh, produce their product. Well, organic. Now, organic can be kind of a tough issue because the way things get certified organic is kind of weird. but the more organic you go, the less pesticides are used, the less chemicals producing those pesticides, the less chemicals go in the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a long chain of things based on your purchasing power. Also, it's healthier because it doesn't have any pesticides on it. Um, go non-toxic. In other words, make your own cleaning supplies. You, you know, try and buy clothes that or bedding or whatever that has not had cancer-causing agents in it. Um, if you buy clothes, for example, from the store and you put them on right then, those clothes almost always, unless you're buying an organic uh, clothing selection, um, those clothes have formaldehyde in them, which is what we use to preserve dead people, and it's also a cancer-causing agent. It's a carcinogen. Not a good combination of those things. So, um, you know, be responsible. Know what's in your clothing. Know what's in your bedding. Know what's in your paint, etc. Try and make the best purchasing decisions you can. Another thing that we can do, remember that trophic pyramid and that, and that rule of 10. Eat more vegetarian meals. One, it's healthier. Your heart will thank you. Your, your, your digestive system will thank you. Your cancer risk will go down. Um, there's a whole lot of advantages to, to eating vegetarian. And you don't have to eat vegetarian every day. You can just have what uh, one of the most popular movements right now is meatless Mondays. And so you just, on Mondays, don't eat anything with meat in it. Um, you know, it's fairly simple to do. It's healthier. You don't get cancer as often. You don't have heart attacks as often. Obesity goes down. Diabetes goes down. There's a huge raft of things Plus, the industrialization of agriculture, especially meat production, is very, very large. And it also produces a lot of greenhouse gases, a lot of water pollution, a lot of soil pollution, a lot of air pollution. So, so all of those things go into what we eat. Just be conscious of your impact. You know, walk, conserve water. You know how to do this. It's hard to do every day. But the more you make it a habit, the easier it is to do. Okay, so uh, that's my little list of things you could possibly do. I hope this uh, is a rewarding end to your lecture series, and I hope you have a great day.